table today um, has invited and suggested I'm going to share with you one of my um, oldest installations theory and one of the ones that's closest to my heart called the Gold Man Pure Restaurant. Um, I started this uh, because this project in 2001 um, when I was in grad school and at that time, my parents had run a Chinese restaurant in the East End here called Pestaval with Sepana in Rosemont. Um, it was like a typical chop soy kind of restaurant serving hybrid, as hybrid cuisine, some people consider it not authentic Chinese um, food. Uh, but um, so my parents ran it for 20, 24, 26 years, and they talked about in 2001, started talking about selling the last the restaurant. It was a place that I grew up in, it was my second childhood home. We, we lived in the apartment above. Um, and so while I was in grad school, I was like, okay, I'm going to start documenting this place. Um, I'm going to start documenting this place, like through photographs, through videos, sketches. Um, not architectural plans, but like my version of architectural plans, um, in any way that I could really capture this place that I grew up in. Um, and as you can see, you know, there's like the, the vinyl booths uh, and also red and black chair. Um, you have lantern. And I started thinking about why is it that almost every Chinese family I knew friends family members or friends of the family, they all ran Chinese restaurants. And um, so I started doing a bit of research into that and looking into the history of the Chinese in Canada and um, that learning that due to a lot of, due to discriminatory laws such as um, and legislations like the head tax that was imposed only on the Chinese community migrants. Um, and then later on with the Exclusion Act of 1923. So this year, it's the 100th anniversary of this um, act um, that prevented, basically banned all, virtually all forms of Chinese immigration to Canada. And because of these acts and, and the um, racist um, attitudes of the time, uh, Chinese migrants weren't able to work in many fields business. They, the only places that were open to them were if they opened up their own restaurants or lodging businesses or grocery stores. And um, and that's because you didn't have to know English or French um, to start this business, you know, and you could just right away um, start working, making money to support your family that you had to leave behind and couldn't bring with you to Canada. Um, so in terms of my family, my great grandfather came in 1907, um, and he also worked in the restaurant business and uh, was separated from the family uh, from 1923 to 1967, when finally he was reunited with uh, my grandparents and my dad and his siblings. Uh, when my grandparents came, they worked right away at Ruby Food, um, which at the time was like, the restaurant to go and to be seen um, at on the carry. Um, and it also was one of the biggest employers of the Chinese immigrant community in Montreal. Almost everybody from my grandparents' generation, many folks from my dad's generation, they all at one point worked at Ruby Foods. Mm -hmm. um, so this is my dad's restaurant. He sold it in 2004. Um, and I, uh, was able to, um, well, one of my first, this was my first uh, exhibition um, based on my dad's restaurant. I wanted to deconstruct and reconstruct certain elements of a Chinese restaurant. So what you had seen, you know, the color red. Um, at the time, I kind of avoided dragons because I felt they were really stereotypical. <laughs> now I've embraced the dragons. So, um, <laughs> But yeah, at the time, I was like, no dragons. Um, looking at, you know, the stereotypical font that's used, um, and every kind of aspect of it, of, of the Chinese project. And I came up with um, Pesadon Project, Old Mountain Pesadon Mountain Dog, which I presented at the May uh, in 2000, 2004. Um, and 
what was really wonderful is you know in my hometown and I was able to borrow my parents sold the restaurant and I was like please can I borrow all this stuff before she was like get the keys to the new owners um but uh the new owners were, were kind enough to let me borrow our own stuff mm -hmm. um for the show and um I also gave myself the challenge of actually seeing if I could acquire um uh, I guess props, as you could say, tables and chairs um, from many sources. So family, friends, but also the botanical gardens, um, which is in the back of uh, across the street from my parents' restaurant. And um, the curator of the bonsai collection was a regular customer, so I said, "Hey, <laughs> you have some spare bonsai I can borrow," um, and he did. Uh, from his own personal collection. And then I brought stuff from Concordia's theater department. So it's just like bringing all these things in and uh, basically recreating the interior of the Chinese restaurant in a gallery space. So be because it's in a gallery space, I was hoping that people, viewers coming in, would kind of have a double take. Like, did this gallery just switch to... <laughs> coming to their senses and making money now. <laughs> um, and um, I was fortunate that um, it was like a pretty large space. So I was able to divide it into a sort of a waiting area, a dining area. And there was also uh, the next slide. Yeah, I managed to put in these swinging double doors that you can enter into this massive kitchen. Um, which um, I also managed to rent. I wasn't able to borrow, but rent restaurant equipment. Um, and then in in this in this in the installation, I have two videos or two sets of videos. One is of my dad preparing hybrid dishes such as egg rolls, um, chop soy, chamini, one time. Um, club sandwich, things that you would find in a Chinese Canadian restaurant as opposed to a Chinese restaurant in Hong Kong or in China. Um, and the second set of videos is um, interviews that I conducted with restaurateurs, either current ones or retired ones. And kind of because I thought, you know, we don't really see their experiences in places like galleries or say later on when I show, I'll show I think I have a, one project that's in a museum. So you don't really see their experiences. Um, I wanted to highlight you know, their stories. Um, so then what was really nice about um, this installation when I first presented it in Halifax um, later on was that a, a student from uh, one of the local universities asked me if he could offer calligraphy workshops in my space. And it never occurred to me that that's one way to activate an exhibition. Um, you know, for me, at the time, because I had just come out of grad school, I was thinking, okay, an exhibition, you make the artwork, you hang it up, people come and look, and then they leave, and that's it, right? Um, and it was just after the student asked me, and I was like, of course, I've got the tables, I've got the chairs. Um, this is a fantastic way of bringing more people in and for them to feel immersed. Um, and then also thinking about how, especially in the prairies, the Chinese restaurant or the Chinese cafe acted in a lot of the small towns, acted as the center of social activity. Um, and that's where people came together. So um, this was just like the staff bringing their lunch in and just eating. And that's also one thing that I encourage people like, this is a sort of restaurant, it's not functional, but you can bring your own food because no one's going to serve you. And that's my dad. So this is, my dad really is a big supporter of my work. And since he had just sold his restaurant, he had nothing else to do. So I said, why don't you come manage my restaurant? <laughs> so he was just like sitting you know, at the counter, greeting people. And I noticed that, and also this was the first time I noticed the, how people reacted um, in the spaces. And you could tell who used to work in a, in a restaurant, not necessarily a Chinese restaurant, but just like any restaurant, especially the older generation. They had no qualms about like 
this is an artwork, even though it's like an installation. I'm going to move these things around because this chair would not be right <laughs> placed here in a real restaurant. It wouldn't work. And so I love that sort of that freedom that they felt in just like moving things and then people who were conditioned by going to museums and like not touching anything. Like, can I go through those double doors? It was really interesting on the other side. Can I? And you know, being hesitant. So, um, so it's like one of the um, things that I learned to kind of um, play with in subsequent um, installations. So now I'm going to play a short excerpt from one of the videos. Oh, if uh, not, you might have I to stop sharing and, and share the other window, yeah. Or you could share your whole screen and then share okay. it. Lemon, the tiger, I mean, i Call vinegar, white vinegar. Last time we put the whisk. From the sugar. Yeah, so what I was interested in besides kind of documenting um, how these dishes were made was to think about how um, Cantonese cuisine um, has been denigrated. You know, it's, it's, it's seen as like, first of all, it's not real Chinese food. Second of all, it's bad for you, unhealthy. Um, and, you know, I wanted to with these videos show that okay yeah there's a lot of sugar and um there's no plum it's actually pumpkin sauce um which uh my dad has a theory is that because pumpkins were readily available in Quebec um and uh then that's what was used and I know that our our waitress um who grew up um I forget where she grew up in the kind of countryside in Quebec in the 1930s like they would always have pumpkin jam. And so at our restaurant, whenever she came to work in the mornings for breakfast, she would have toast and just put the um sauce on it, just like she similar to what she had as a, as a child growing up. So I'm going to show you a couple of other sort of installations because I've shown this maybe 15 or 16 times across Canada and then a few times in the UK and one twice in the States. Um, and what was really great about this project is it allowed me to go travel. Um, I'd spend maybe like two weeks to two months in a given place to do research, um, to see how similar or different the Chinese restaurants or the history of the Chinese restaurant in the community was from say Montreal. Um, and then to, to, to exhibit or to produce um, another version of Gold Mountain Restaurant that would um, reflect the local taste and local um, sort of identity. 
So here was um, when they showed in Toronto in 2006. And I have to say, it was like one of the hardest places to find things. Um, everywhere else, uh, even like Montreal, I guess Montreal, I have the advantage of being from here. They're like Vancouver. Um, people were really generous in lending me stuff. But Toronto, they were like, how much are you going to pay us? <laughs> Uh, now, um, here's the rental fee. Um, so I, luckily, I was able to borrow proper rent at a discount from the CBC warehouse prop, uh, props warehouse before it closed down. Um, so a lot of the stuff that you'll see here, like the tables and chairs, I was going for a tavern look um, or from CBC. Um, the lanterns are ones that I made with my dad. So I, I collaborate with my dad a lot, um, whether it's like just video, uh, like videos of him making Chinese community dishes or asking him to do some woodworking elements for my projects. Um, and for this presentation, um, I had found out about um, the China Chinese restaurant um, 15 part series uh, by Chuck Kwan, um, where he went all over the world. Uh, to places like Israel, Norway, Cuba, Argentina, um, and then like Saskatchewan, um, and interviewed band Chinese families who ran restaurants. Um, and it's like just fascinating. So I asked him, I invited him to um, screen two, I, for, I forget, I think it's two or three of the episodes. Um, and then we had a, a Now, this one, uh, also in 2006. Uh, there's no amnesty at friendship dinner, nor cats. Uh, like, but nor cats is just a playful reference to how um, one of the things people say about Chinese cuisine is that we don't know if they're serving us rats, dogs, or cats. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a playful kind of poking fun at that, and at that uh, stereotype. Um, when I shared this in Brandon, um, again, I did the I did a residency before and just to do the research and the gallery was actually uh, on the second floor of the shopping center in what used to be Eaton's. And um, every day when I walked past the food court, there was this group of um, Chinese men who were just, I could feel like their heads swivel every time I walked past because it was a I clocked them, they clocked me, they're like, there's a new Chinese space in town, who is she? And then I finally just like introduced myself. Um, coincidence, they all were retired restaurateurs. So I think perfect. Um, so I got chatting with them in conversation and um, I interviewed a few of them. Um, and then that's just Daniel Moon, who is one of my favorite um, elders. Um, he ran a restaurant, a couple of cafes um, in Winnipeg and also in Brandon. Um, and I'll show you an excerpt from a video. And in this space, it was like massive. I think this is the thing with the prairies. Everything is just huge. And so I was like, I don't know what to fill, how to fill this up. I've got a really big dining area. I have a... Um, a very big kitchen. And then I thought, okay, you know what? I'll put in living quarters. Because this is another thing too, back in the, back in the day um, that um, restaurateurs, when they kind of pull their resources together, they would also live behind the restaurant or in our case, above the restaurant. Um, so I wanted to have that. Um, these are some of the, the women who, who worked in many restaurants. Um, and then we just kind of held workshops um, every week, whether it's uh, creating your own menu based on your family, your community's cuisine. Um, and then uh, a local um, high school association um, or teachers association, they asked me if they could hold their like, at day meetings, um, and they ordered they ordered Chinese food from another Chinese restaurant, <laughs> and I could see the look of confusion on the delivery guy's face. Some <laughs> 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 yeah, I office works. Yeah. 
So I'm going to play this item just with another minute or two. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ah, uh, you play him. Ah, yeah. Oga Mamma give them to Kuaira. Hey, man, some people. Oh, yeah. Mother Salom, they can eat and go you some people. Oh, yeah. I have one of them. A panic, you may manga. Then you learn. Yeah. I chúng mạnh nè chúng mạnh nè xem muốn nó vòng tên và nhớ kêu nghề lục nên hay muốn để phát xuất sai mà dùng cái sai lâu dùng cái mới mà xây lối quan hệ nó muốn mà bác của cho xem là người bà ba nó đã người làm tên người phan ở trường cốc là đó họ cái họ cái step mà nó lướt áp tới mọi cái 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 tên mới nhá你鄉下邊度啊嚇鄉下邊度啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊啊
how did it look like? And then one of the final ones that I showed in, in Canada was in 2008 called On, On Rock Garden. And um, at, yeah, it was in, at AK Gallery in Saskatoon. And it was the inaugural show of their new space that used to be in Toon's Kitchen. Um, and when they sent me the photographs before they had done all the renovations, I asked the gallery, can you save me like those sites? Um, can you save me anything that you can save from the restaurant? And so I was able to incorporate them um, in the show and kind of make it sort of a, a remembrance to the, the site of what it used to be. So finally, um, I think this is the last one um, of, of the restaurant projects. So this is what I showed in the UK and the touring, and I always wanted to make a facade. Um, and what's different about working in the UK as an artist is the they have a different notion of space. Um, in in England or in the UK, they're used to um, I guess more takeout, more takeaway counters for restaurants for Chinese restaurants, I should say. And so they didn't understand why I needed such a large space for my installation. And I had to say, well, in Canada, we have a lot of space. <laughs> and I'm talking about the Canadian Chinese restaurant, not the UK takeaway, which I'd love to do a separate project on. But um, right now, I want all the space. I want to be a space hog. Um, <laughs> And I wanted actually with the facade just to leave the back of it bra um, so that you can see that it is a construct. You know, this was something that was constructed for the Western, you know, customer known Chinese palette and, and sort of the idea of um, self-exoticization, uh, kind of performing this as a, I mean, it's an economic survival strategy. And um, so I think this one's the final project I'm going to show you. So it's something they showed in 2017 um, at Concordia and sort of this, this the train that they have. And at the same parallel to my restaurant installations, I, I collected a lot of restaurant ephemera, like um, match covers, menus. Um, my dad never returned. He stole. Um, <laughs> he stole these tiki mugs from his boss in Boston. <laughs> I think he borrowed them and then he just never gave them back. Um, and um, and yeah, and then, you know, thinking about Chinese material culture or Chinese diasporic material culture, I should say. Um, and just I love, I mean, I love the kitchens, the colors, the fonts, and then the scene the kind of language that's being used in the menus to sell. Um, this cuisine or to sell this idea of, you know, when you enter a Chinese restaurant, you're entering a different world. And at the end of the presentation, um, the gallery and I organized a restaurant hop around all the Chinese restaurants, not all, four, five of the Chinese restaurants around um, Concordia. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that is. So, that's my presentation. <laughs> Thanks. Screen sharing? Uh, sure, then we'll, we'll have the, the camera on. I'll do this for our recording. Yeah, yeah, it's four questions. Questions. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. So you are using this language of deconstruction and construction from you know the environment where you were raised into something that you're trying to showcase to the world. Could you elaborate a bit more about kind of what you mean by using this word? Was it like what what is it that you're deconstructing and constructing? Mm -hmm. Is it at a psychological level, at a philosophical level, mm -hmm. cultural, you know? All of the above. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, um, on, on a you know, surface level, material level, is seeing the elements, the the material evidence, um, material aspects of a restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's like the lanterns, like the drywoods, the color, the color red. For example, um, 
At some restaurants I've been to, they even have bridges. And I, I've built a mini bridge for one of my equations too. And, um, like what, what are some of these elements that keep popping up in Chinese restaurants mm -hmm. that inform us on a subconscious level that we're entering into a different place? Yeah. You know, uh, a China which <clears throat> doesn't exist, like the, the way that it's being presented, it's not the real China, but you're entering this full constructed China. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess, and also, what I, I know everyone's been to a Chinese restaurant, right? And so with the inflation, people can relate to it, whether it's um, eating at one, being a customer at one, or as a, a former staff member or as a restaurateur. So it's also bringing up memories, memories of experiences. What I do with my installations, I, I look at how the corporeal experience um, of it. So how you move through the installations through, you know, whether it's um, you're actually going down, you're going to sit down yeah. um, or you know, standing, leaning against the bar counter, pushing your way through the doors. Um, sometimes I, less so with the restaurant installations, I play with heights, um, you know, whether you actually have to duck down um, or I don't think I did anything where you had to hop over. Um, I could have made these little things that I joked that, oh, they'd be great obstacles for dogs to <laughs> hop over rabbits, you know. Um, but it's that that corporeal experience that actually informs you at a certain level of um, the history um, of a site, of a place, and of its community. Um, you know. And then I also include other elements, like, um, for example, a menu that I created that talks about some of, gives you the background of some of these dishes, mm -hmm. um, but also brings in references to the, the exclusion act that I mentioned earlier. Um, so then you, know, you can come at, it at the project with different um, levels. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, I was curious on you mentioned it a little bit here and there talking about different regions uh, and how they differ. So I was wondering for one, is there anything specifically Montreal, Chinese Montreal uh, restaurant, all of these? Uh, and second is, is there like a difference between like if you go more westward, like do you see like some things change or is it more very like regional like? For example, like Winnipeg is like very much like this, mm -hmm. and uh, like Vancouver is very much like this. Mm -hmm. And say, so it, it just because it's more west doesn't mean that like it's changing. It just like mm -hmm. it's just very specific. Yeah. Uh, um, I think for the most part, it's it's very similar. They're very similar. Um, out in the prairies, there's this word. Pronounce mm -hmm. Smorg is short for the word I can't pronounce. Smorg is word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so there's things. Um, so there's that, and um, yeah, I don't. And I think the kind of restaurant that I'm looking at these chopped soy ones, um, that it is all sort of the, the early generation, and and because some of them they see like, uh, for example, the Sunset Cafe in Bedford, uh, Nova Scotia. They had actually worked at the Yangtze restaurant that was um, out in Cote St. Luke. And that's also another restaurant that a lot of people had worked at before. And I think they wanted to replicate the success of it. So they 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 lifted the logo. Um, and also some of the, the, the aesthetics of that. Um, and so that's something I noticed as well. Like even the ruby food that I mentioned, there was there were two famous ruby foods, one in New York, I think, and one in Washington. And I think the one in Montreal that was started by twins who became the chancellors of McGill and Princeton. One was like the Ivy Leagues. But, so they weren't Chinese, they were Jewish. Um, and they were like university chancellors. Uh, they, their dad, I think, started it and they ran it. Um, oh, but mm -hmm. I think that also they wanted to to copy the success of the Ruby Cruz in the American. Mm -hmm. 
Um, kind of based on John's question, um, I was wondering, like, so I did my undergrad in the United States, and I came to, like, before I came to Montreal, I was just thinking, oh, it's going to be very similar. Um, and then I came here, I realized it's, like, my ignorance to, like, think about Canada and U.S. are very similar. So I was just thinking about, like, the relationship between Canadian Chinese mm -hmm. restaurant and American Chinese mm -hmm. restaurant. And, like, for instance, like, where did Chop, chop Sui started and where like and how does it flow between these two immigrant countries mm -hmm. yeah yeah um thanks for your question so i i had done i, I had done my my grad studies in the states in chicago so that's the one i'm a little bit more familiar with in terms of the restaurant mm -hmm. um but like all my research was from 20 years ago now so a lot of things have changed mm -hmm. um but um i mean I know from speaking to my family members and, and um, family friends that it used to be a lot more porous for traveling um, and, and, and between Canada and the States. And a lot of people here would travel and work in Boston mm -hmm. um, or, or um, in New York and other places too. Um, and so I think, again, like, in general, it's it's very similar. Mm -hmm. like you you do have some um, more specific, uh, you know, unique you know, characters say, say in, in Quebec, um, even from like Montreal versus places in um, yeah, or in Quebec City, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then um, I know I didn't touch upon it in my presentation, but. Um, Part of my PhD was looking at the evolution of Chinese restaurants from, like, say, 1900 to 2000, mm -hmm. um, and the decor, the type of cuisine. So first, like, it was the cafes, which didn't serve any Chinese food, mm -hmm. say, from the 1900s to the 1930s or so. Um, they had distinctly non-Chinese names. Um, I think <clears throat> that they went for names that indicated that it was it was not Chinese, so it was like the Maple Cafe, King's mm -hmm. Cafe. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, like just uh, yeah, very, very generic. Mm -hmm. um, and then from the 30s, say the 30s, 40s, when people were venturing to um to Chinatowns because it was like it was thrilling, it was vineyards were dangerous. Um so then they started, um, there started to be more uh, dishes that were offered that was Chinese, but adapted mm -hmm. um, to the Western taste. And, um, in the late 40s, 50s, then we had the uh, Chinese dinner dance um, places so and entertainment, but also um, with dinner. Um, and then in the 50s, 60s, uh, you also have the Polynesian tiki kind of craze, um, uh, as well as, uh, again, what I mentioned earlier about people having more sophisticated tastes and um, Chinese um, chefs were saying, you know what, Chinese cuisine is more than just chop story. Mm -hmm. There's high end mm -hmm. Chinese food as well. And mm -hmm. so it started with offers they sent home um, food and uh, and go on in like the 70s and 80s, it was the year of the buffets. Um, so on, and then I guess 90s and 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and so on, and then I, I stopped my research. So I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't get the postdoc, so I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not looking at the 2000s and onwards. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Well, yeah, just based on that, because uh, you say um, the installation you made is more about the first generation Chinese restaurant. And I just realized because nowadays in China, there's a less and less restaurant like this traditional mm -hmm. style. And also like in Montreal, the new generation's restaurant, mm -hmm. I found it's mostly dumplings. And yeah, it's, yeah, like, yeah. it's kind of also very different from the style of the first generation. So I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if you like, if you were gonna maybe um, including some of the new elements, how would you 
like maybe do a new um, yeah. installation yeah. exhibition of all that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know, but that's a good idea. <laughs> to a work in progress. <laughs> but yeah, one, one thing like that last um the last project that I showed you where it was like in the vitrine with all my um camera collection. Um and I did the restaurant hops and I was trying to collect menus from the local restaurants around Concordia and I was like I don't understand why don't you have a menu why don't you have business cards like, like I was just like this isn't computing in my head because I'm so old school um <laughs> but like it made sense like they're serving the immediate um client like clientele who lives or works or goes to school in the immediate neighborhood and so they don't need to have the takeout menu they don't need to have the business card mm -hmm. um but the reason why I collected the, these things is that for some restaurants, it's the only evidence um, and documents that they existed. Yeah. And that's partly why I wanted to keep them and to sort of start this collection. Yeah, uh, hi. Um, so I saw your exhibition at the McCordy Museum. Oh. Um, you guys can go see it. <laughs> yeah, it's right across the street. <laughs> It was really interesting because I was seeing things that were familiar to me mm -hmm. uh, from like my grandparents' generation in a exhibition space, mm -hmm. and it was a, a really cool experience, you know. Um, and I'm thinking when you show like all these exhibitions you have done, uh, there must be some sort of project where it's collected in the sense that your work is meaningful to the community that you mm -hmm. represent. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess that was my experience going into the McCord Museum saying, like, I never thought that my granddad's stuff would be considered like art, you know? Yeah. Uh, so how do you straddle the kind of tension between having to represent a community mm -hmm. and also like your individual perspective? Mm -hmm. Question. Yeah. Thanks for the question. It's really good. Um, yeah, uh, so the way I approach it or how I approached this particular exhibition project was um, um, really from my own family's experience, kind of, it's not unique. Um, it's something I think a lot of people, not just people in the Chinese community, but I think like from the immig any immigrant community can relate to. Um, and so kind of using that as a way for people to be able to connect. Um, and I wanted to leave it open too, and I always want to include some element of collaboration or community aspect in my work because I am talking to community. Um, and yeah, kind of what you're saying about you never thought your grandfather's stuff would be seen as art or in a museum, that's, that's, um, that's something that I've encountered a lot. And when I was asking uh, folks um, in the community to kind of spread the word if they could uh, lend their photographs or um, heirlooms or family treasures, um, you know, some of them would say, like, why would I have kept my photographs? Like, it, it's not important for, or else the other thing <laughs> is uh, they'd say, I don't want to remember. I don't need to remember it. Um, and I think it is important to um with this show i thought okay thinking approaching it in the way where i'm representing the community is a lot of pressure and i don't think one should put that on oneself mm -hmm. so how i how i um looked at it or how i wanted to present this project was this is a proposal for example for what a future montreal chinese archive would look like <laughs> um, this is just a start mm -hmm. um, and um, who would that involve? Individuals, families, community, in collaboration with institutions such as the court. Um, and I think that way, keeping it open uh, in that way, um, people have, and I, I've, I've encountered this in the fact that even more so this time is that because folks have been really generous in my room, a lot of stuff that I could include, they felt that. It, they sort of felt ownership um, of the project. Mm -hmm. And that was really wonderful. Like, because they would then tell the friends to come, they would bring mm -hmm. their kids, their mm -hmm. grandkids 
to see all of our parents um, to see it. And I've been approached already by I mean, two organizations in Chinatown to see if it was possible to bring uh, to show a, a smaller version of this in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so we're kind of in discussion about that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you said something kind of midway through your talk about, I think you called it the auto exoticization of mm -hmm. a community. Mm -hmm. And that really stuck out to me because I'm curious, like in the context these restaurants originated, mm -hmm. it was almost like survival. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, I'm going to make my favorite food and share it with this new country. It's, I'm going to make food that's going to suit the palate of the local community inspired by. And I'm curious if, well, I'm curious for anything you have to comment on this idea of the auto exoticization and how that affected pride and a sense of belonging and like I'm yeah, I think almost just developing within this community and developing an identity. And then I guess the other part that I think must be inevitable is these common elements that you find in different Chinatowns must be the things that people are the most proud of, mm -hmm. where it's like, no matter what, I'm going to show this. <laughs> and, yeah. and so it pops up, and I wonder if there's an interplay between the development of the food, like, okay, we accept this, yeah. maybe we can try this. And then if it evolved that way based on things you think people genuinely like that were running the restaurants versus what people are going to actually buy. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the self-exoticization, um, it is a form of economic survival. Um, and it's kind of are you if you do practice that, are you complicit in the stereotyping of the culture of the community? Yes, but then you also have to weigh that with well, what's gonna put food on the table? And no, I, I think that. And from my research, um, and just uh, talking with um, with restaurateurs, that in some way they're proud. They're proud. Like for them, it's not necessarily stereotype. Um, so it's yeah. There's there's these different things at play, and it's not just the restaurants. Like say um, the souvenir shops that are actually selling commodification of, of the culture and the selling of um, all these knickknacks um, that uh, can be associated with um, uh, Chinese culture, with red lanterns, uh, dragons. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and that, that's something I'm really interested in, too. Uh, 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 how they're, yeah, I, yeah, the tension between them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, wonderful book. Um, I was amazed by your artwork, and then if I were to go to that uh, exhibition, I feel like I'm gonna just sit uh, in one of the chairs and wait for something to be served. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so much like it, it felt natural to look at this space, mm -hmm. but then I wonder. Uh, I think one of the purpose of your artwork is to provide people uh, another objective view of the experience you have in those kind of spaces. And that would not happen if that space actually really felt like a restaurant. Like I went in and just like, um, waited for the food. Um, so I feel like you have to kind of program in a sense of um, strangeness mm -hmm. so that you realize, oh, wait a second, this is not a restaurant. Yeah. Um, did it come naturally, naturally by the fact that it was an exhibition or did you um, kind of like systematically program it in one mm -hmm. way? Or... Um, I think just the fact that it was in a gallery or a museum space. Mm -hmm. um, and then to also show like, these places, these sites, also deserve to be in a museum or in a gallery. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, definitely um, that sort of bring that disconnect where you say, hold on. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and definitely um, I try to, to kind of touch upon the haptic senses. Um, sometimes um, some of the some of the, the versions I would actually put um, um, in essence, 
almond oil essence. But that's what my dad used to put in the almond cookies, so you can smell it. So you can smell it, and then um, I stopped doing that because um, I suddenly remembered some of my friends are allergic like, to smells, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to. Um, yeah, I, I I didn't want that to make people uncomfortable that way. I wanted to make them feel uncomfortable, but not that way. Mm -hmm. Sure. This is an inherently silly question. But, uh, in Chinese restaurants, the joke of it is the storage room is also the washroom. Wondering if you, there was, and I assume it's also present in other Chinese restaurants as well. I was wondering if that played a role in your exhibition or it wasn't possible because, for one, you didn't want to do it, or two, that you could have put a washroom in an exhibition. There was only one, like the first one they show you that they actually had washrooms in the gallery space. So I used that. Oh, I, I played with that. Oh, um, um, but that was the only one. Uh -huh. um, the the other the other ones I had, they didn't have any stores. I I like to play with the existing architectural features. I was always hoping that there'd be another gallery that had some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, another short question comes from Alexis observation that you are and your observation that you're representing your community mm -hmm. in your art so why is the audience that you have in mind in specific when you are doing this work is it kind of like as a representative of the community you are offering an interpretation of the community to the community or are you, are you also having in mind the outsider the cultural outsider that you know uh, when when you're doing this as a as a way of being like this is our life, you know what I'm trying to ask. Like I think it's kind of like different kind of goals in mind or audiences. Um. So my my main goal from the main sorry audience um is the community. Okay. Um. Because I'm working with or I'm collaborating with them and I'm in incorporating their their memories mm -hmm. in this exhibition space. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to show their stories okay. that haven't necessarily been told or been shown before. And then just by default that most of these installations have been in galleries and museums. So it already has this um, existing audience, which is mostly in white, um, yeah. wealthy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so sometimes I like to just poke fun at them too, but in a way that um, they laugh at themselves. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what was the reception when you showed your art in China? Okay, so I only... <laughs> <laughs> so my um, I've only shown it once um, at the Russian um, uh, museum, which is in Shenzhen, and so that's across from Hong Kong. Um, and I was really excited because it was my first time, and. Uh, it was this museum, it was a show, it was the third version uh, edition of the overseas Chinese art exhibitions. So it was like a survey of what's happening now, work made by contemporary um, Chinese diasporic artists. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was excited because I wanted to see like what kind of um, dialogue that we could have. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think because of the, the the installation I showed was in a restaurant. It was um, a Chinese Bali that was also slash souvenir shop from Chinatown of the 1930s, 40s. It was just like a mishmash of these things. And um, I wanted to keep the, the shipping costs low. And also I was worried about um, the time, the schedule, because you just never know with shipping um, by actual boat. Um, how long that could take and any delays. And I just thought, you know what? I'm going to have this work made in China. So, like, I'm, my work is always about like, made in China. Um, and I thought, this is great. I'll just have this made in China. So I sent them my plans for the structure. Um, and then all the stuff inside, most of the stuff inside, I sent them a list uh, kind of like how souvenir shops, you know, that they get their inventories into the list. 
And some of this material, they said we couldn't find it in China. We had to buy it in America. <laughs> um, and then in terms of the reception, it was really, really positive. I think it was just positive for the whole show in general. But for mine, I think because most of their audience, um, and it's free to enter in the so that they didn't have this uh, barrier of this of access, um, that most of their audience had family or friends who immigrated to North America. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was that aspect that they could relate to. It would be great though to talk to, I don't, I don't speak Mandarin, so I wasn't able to like, have the conversation, except to say I don't know how to speak Mandarin. Mm -hmm. um, but that would have been really great to actually have a conversation mm -hmm. and hear what their thoughts were. It makes me think about like uh, cafes in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. Not like colonial style mm -hmm. food, but yeah. to have like those two spaces almost as mirrors of each other, like the like the North American Chinese restaurant next to the Hong Kong kind of mm -hmm. like yeah. I don't know what yeah. kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Um, I have a question. I think that's that might be the perfect question to <laughs> to finish up, uh, which is like I I always wonder like you like for artists there's a lot of reason to start a project, but at a certain point there's an end, and I wonder like because on your website it says it's like a project until 2018 mm -hmm. and I wonder what's the reason that you decided to stop it was it was supposed to stop at 2008 oh. <laughs> it was supposed to stop kind of um just before I went to to start my PhD I was like this is it I've done it for uh seven years mm -hmm. and then when I was in the UK I, I was invited to throw it I was like ah okay yeah okay I'll do this um and then you know, I thought, you know what, I'll just keep this open. Mm -hmm. If um, other places want to show this, um, mm -hmm. I'll be I'll be up for it. I'll be open to the idea. Um, I showed it in 2017 in Toronto at U of T. Um, and then I showed it again in Hartford in Connecticut in, I think, 2018, 2019. Um, and what was different from with those two was that I didn't spend um, time mm -hmm. um, to do further research to, to actually talk to people who were working now in mm -hmm. restaurant in 2017 in restaurants. Mm -hmm. I just uh, that would have been fantastic to do and to add that additional layer, mm -hmm. but um, just I just didn't have time. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's such a lame excuse. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask one more question? <laughs> yes. She reminded me that from the beginning. I don't know if you can answer this or if it's um, but I was so curious. Like, why did you like? What gave you this idea? And like, what and, like what made you want to do this to such a degree in intricacy? Um, my parents wanted to sell the restaurant and using before they grew up. Um, yeah. But like now, when I talk to my parents, it's just like uh, the restaurant is still around. Um, it's a five minute drive from their place. They're like, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> like, they do not care at all about the restaurant. I, I thought that maybe after they sold it, they might feel you know, like still like attached to it. I mean, they did work there. I worked there. Um, after they sold it, um, just to kind of help with the smoother transition. Um, but yeah, it was just like, wow. Like something that was part of your life for 26 years. Mm -hmm. I hope that you never think of this as me. <laughs> yeah, and, and because it, um, you know, I started thinking about how the restaurant as a construct, cultural, um, and you know, place that's constructed um, in the West um, that just led me to exploring other like the souvenir shop or um, booking them or um, the recent years, um, the studios of early Chinese Canadian photographers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.